on the one hand, the, the technologies um, brought us expanded choice. And these are just photographs of new families. They're not all from Israel. This is a lady from Romania who was 60 years old um, when she had her child. Um, this is on the left is a photograph of grandparents who um, have contracted with um, a single woman who would like to be the mother um, of a child born from the posthumous sperm of their son. In other words, these are grandparents who would like a grandson and a single mom who would like a child from sperm donation to have grandparents. And so that's one uh, very creative kind of um, relationship. Um, these, this is a gay couple, a big fuss about them. Who They had their child in India. The immigration wouldn't let them back into the country. In the end, they did get back into the country. But gay couples are having kids in gay and lesbian couples. And this is um, a photograph. We, we also have uh, children of uh, sperm donations looking for their um, fathers. And uh, this is one family where the women sort of threw the net, uh, through the web, found out that there are 70 siblings from this one sperm donor. And 26 of them came together in New Jersey and had a family reunion and all the kids got to know each other. So this is really wonderful. We've got, um, you know, really creative individuals using the technologies to create new forms of families. Um, but on the other hand, when we look at what's going on in terms of, of, of the gender, we're not seeing um, a very happy um, picture. We're seeing that women are undergoing procedures in their own bodies because men want to perpetuate their male genetic lineage. Um, we see um, women normative, um, women, have, women having to answer to new standards of perfection both for themselves and for their children. I really do not envy women who are having children today. When I was, um, when I had my, uh, my child, I didn't even have one ultrasound because it didn't exist. And now just the anxieties and the stresses that young women have to go through when they're having babies, I really do not envy them because there are new standards and they have to meet all the standards and it's very confusing and it's very stressful for these young women. And of course, the objectification, the fragmentation, the stratification, the exploitation. I think Marsha spoke about it much more eloquently than I ever could. And I think that the point is really that um, we thought that this would expand women's choices, but it's created new expectations and very high demands from women. Again, I'm speaking of women of privilege who have access to these technologies. And they don't have a choice, much of a choice, not to use the technology. So to refuse to use the technology takes an enormous amount of moral effort, I would say. It's an act of dissidence not to use the technology when it's available and it's accessible. Um, and that's so, in, so in place of the tyranny of biology, that this technology was supposed to liberate us from the, from the tyranny of biology, I think that we're finding ourselves living in new dependence on the technology. So we see women going back. In my country, there's no limitation on public funding for IVF. So we see women going back for cycles, repeated cycles of treatment. We see women who, who, who their doctors tell them to go to Eastern Europe 10 times for an egg donation. So these are patterns of dependence. These are patterns of even addiction to the technology. And we do create the dependence that we have on technology is a form of addiction. So as a result, we see new forms of suffering. So women who have access to the, to the technologies are experiencing new forms of suffering. There is a technological fix, and the te technological fix creates a new need, and then there's another technological fix. And the greed and the desire to meet the standards of the four by four, the perfect IKEA child, whatever we're talking about, the greed and the desire that motivate this activity 
the women are, the consumers are also part of it. And it translates into, on the one hand, a sense of entitlement, not just a right, but, you know, I, have, I want, I need, and I have a right. I am entitled to very quickly translating the consumerist discourse, very quickly translates from I want into I'm entitled to, and right now. Right now I need it. I can't wait. I need it right now. This is the consumerist culture. Um, so um, I think um, Raina, is Raina here? Raina Rapp, the women, hi Raina. The women as moral bioneers, the women are actually, women are actually bioneering this technology. These are the, and I think that we need to be looking at the level of the individual women who are actually making the choices, making the decisions. They are moral agents. I don't know how much support they're getting. I don't know how much choice they actually have about what they decide. So I'm going back to caring about the suffering of women. And I also think that we should build on the human rights space. I'm, I'm a human rights through and through. That's my basis. But I really think that when I am a person of privilege and I have my human rights, I need to exercise responsibility, and I think that we should be moving, we should try to move into, from the place of privilege, we should be moving into a place where we're looking at non, not being judgmental, being very non-judgmental, being very understanding of the fixes that women, young women, are finding themselves in but really supporting them to see that there are alternatives, that there are options, that they do not have to play into this game. And um, so um, the receptivity, responsiveness, relatedness, this is the Nell Noddings um, model of the ethics of care that is based on Carol Gilligan's idea of responsibility as the building block of morality, responsibility. It's so, and this is bringing me to my final slide, and I will do it very briefly, because I do think that in general, um, the, what, what my concern about the technology is, is how it reduces human being into matter. And the, um, the geneticism is very materialistic. And I think that we're losing sight of what, what it is in the human that is not measurable, that cannot be calculated. Um, technology is, it's also, of course, it's, this also has, I think, very clear gender um, subtexts to it. The technology is very, very material. I think the technology epitomizes the height of human reason. I think that it really is a, um, it testifies to the amazing achievements of human reason. But I think that what we really need more now, and not just in this area, but at the end of life as well, I think that what we need now is not rational intelligence. I think what we need now is emotional intelligence about how to use these amazing technologies that we have at our disposal and how to use them skillfully. Um, so um, we have these new forms of human being. We have embryos on the one hand, frozen embryos, frozen fertilized eggs. And at the end of life, we have this fourth age of people who are also completely dependent on machines and um, really tax their carers very heavily. And how do we relate to these new form, forms of human life that are a result of the medical technology, not just the reprogenetic, but the medical technology in general? So what I'm saying is that can we move from the head to the heart? And what does it mean to move from the head to the heart when we're going to be discussing in the next few days? Thank you.